All right, take your Bible this evening, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We are finishing up what we started last Wednesday night. Give me just a little bit more, Dean, if you would. <clears throat> finishing up what we started last Wednesday night on Be Ye Separate. We look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And beginning in verse number 14, where the Bible says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty." Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture here tonight, and Lord, I'm asking again that you would open our understanding as we look at this important doctrine of separation in the Bible. And Lord, I pray that we would have the wisdom and the ability, the power from you to obey this command to come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Help us to... Uh, Holy Spirit, teach each one of the folks that are here this evening who know you as their Savior. Be the teacher and illuminate the Word of God to their heart tonight as we look at the Scriptures we'll look at this evening and apply it to our, each of our lives as we live in this present evil world. And Lord, we'll praise you for what you'll do and we thank you for, in advance for speaking to our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, let me uh, uh, review just a little bit for you, because uh, we're, we're continuing what we did last Wednesday night, and uh, this will help some of you maybe just kind of picking it up. Maybe you weren't able to be here last week, and uh, some, most of you, even if you were here, you don't have any idea what we said anyway, and uh, so you need to get review so you remember what we talked about. Um, we're, we're, we're talking about, be ye separate, saith the Lord. And by the way, we talked about how it's very rare that... that you hear anyone talk about separation anymore. But it is a doctrine of the Bible. And uh, it's part of the Bible that you cannot ignore. You should not ignore. And we have to look and see when God says, Be ye separate, saith the Lord, what did he mean by that? And, and are we obeying that? And am I following that command? Uh, we, we talked about separation being taught all the way through the Bible that it's taught uh, back in, in the book of Deuteronomy, even from the farmer who is, uh, couldn't plow with the oxen and ass together, uh, reminding himself that that's an unequal yoke, and that uh, he, God made him to be different, and God chose his people to be different from the people around them, and they would not to be in an unequal yoke with them. Uh, the same thing with their garments they would wear. We talked about Isaiah who saw in his vision the seraphims who stood before the throne of God and those seraphims that said day and night and continually, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. All right, now, holy, holy, holy. We said that that is the same word as the word separated. Uh, you could say just as easily those, those seraphims are saying separated, separated, separated. Why? There's no God like him. He's far above all gods. There is none like Him. You'll see that phrase repeated often in the Old Testament. I'm the Lord their God. There's none like me. And there isn't any like Him. And so He's separated. And so He looks at us as believers and He says, Be ye holy, be ye separate, because I am holy. I am separate. And so we're separate because He is separate. We talked about every believer is a saint. Uh, where every a saint isn't somebody who uh, a certain church declares to be a saint. Uh, when you receive Christ as your Savior, you become a saint, uh, a set apart one, set apart for God, and set apart for His service. Then we said number two that there's to be a clear difference between a child of God 
and a child of Satan. And we looked at the contrast in 2 Corinthians 6. We talked about uh, uh, don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. We talked about the righteousness with unrighteousness. We talked about light with darkness. We talked about Christ with Belial. Belial is uh, men of wickedness, people of wickedness. What do people of Christ have to do with people of wickedness? And, and how direct opposites all of those are. The temple of God and the temple of idols. Built for two completely different purposes. And, 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 and ought to be such a clear distinction between those that are saved and those that are lost. Those that belong to God and those that belong to Satan. There ought to be a clear distinction between them. And we talked about how we, we don't see that distinction very much in these days. And it's hard to tell the difference between one or the other. But that's not what the Bible says we ought to be like. Then, we mentioned, number three, that we're to be separate from the world. And we talked about not the creation that God has made. Certainly, that is good. And God made everything good. And God saw, remember everything He made? Then it was, behold, very good. Okay? Not the creation, but the system that we live in the philosophy of the world and the way of the world and the thinking of the world. A lot of times people are, are, are so much, we get so much more concerned about the things of the world than we do the things of God. We get so much more concerned about the things of the world than we do the things of eternity. And, and we, we get worldly minded. Somebody says, oh, he's so heavenly minded, he's no earthly good. That's a rare thing I don't know that I've ever seen anybody like that. I have seen a lot of worldly people that are not much heavenly good. And that's the battle most of us fight, is not to be so caught up in the things of this world. We talked about be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And we talked about how the, the, the Bible says we haven't received the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. We don't have the, we, have, we get the spirit that comes from God, not the attitudes and the philosophy of the world. And, and it's so easy to succumb to that. Remember we talked about Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. You fell in love with the world. And when you love the world, in fact we found out in James, if you love the world, you're the enemy of God. Okay? You can't, you can't have both. And so friendship with the world is, is the enemy of God. We're not to love the world, neither the things that are in the world. Uh, we went all through these things about the world and seeing how harmful and how difficult the world can be. And listen, far, far above uh, blatant immorality or blatant sin, what has ruined more Christians is simple worldliness. Being caught up in the things of the world. What, what chokes the word in people's lives is worldliness. The cares of this world. And it chokes the world and we become unfruitful. We illustrated last week, Xavier came to me while we were shaking hands. He said, I just want to let you know the world is here tonight. So uh, Xavier was the world for us. And come on up here, Xavier. We illustrated this. And we illustrated this last week. Xavier was a picture of the world. And, and if I'm, the, I'm the picture of the believer, okay? And, and really the picture of God. If, if God, is God different than the world? Yeah, like, like polar opposites, okay? Uh, strictly very, very different. If we would get the, the true sense, he would be as far as that, he could go on that wall and I'd be as far as I'd go on this wall. That's how we get as far apart as we possibly could. Okay, but for illustration purposes, we'll say, okay, we are going to be separate from the world. You ought to be able to tell someone who's a Christian and who belongs to God from someone who belongs to the world. Okay, now, the world is not getting better. Would you agree? Okay, Everybody, we don't have any problem there, no debate there. So the world is getting worse, which means they're getting farther away from God and God's standard. Okay, now, but for the believer, for the Christian, we're to stand right where God stands. Let me ask you a question. Does God change? No. I am the Lord thy God. I change not. Okay. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. He's always the same. Truth is constant. Truth is absolute. Okay. So, the world continues to get worse. And, and listen, here's where, where so many Christians make the mistake. 
Am I still separate from the world? Yeah, but wait a minute. Who used to be here? The world did. See? And that's why some of us have been around a while. <laughs> we can look and see, man, I can't believe some of the stuff they're doing in church now. Because I've lived long enough and I've been a Christian long enough, they, uh, they used to preach against this stuff that they're doing now inside a church. And, and the world just keeps getting worse. And now, I'm worse than what the world used to be. But wait a minute, you say, wait a minute, man, I'm still separate. Huh? I'm not as bad as they are. See? But look, you know what? Hey, I'm a long way away from where I'm supposed to be. And so, even some believers today who still think, well, I'm separate from the world, but of course, I'm where the world used to be 20 years ago, 25 years ago. But they look over at the person who's the Bible believer and wants to stay where God is and say, man, are you a weirdo? Man, you guys are really straight. Man, get with it. You guys are really out of step. Out of step with who? I, I'm, not, I'm not in it to be in step with the world. I, I think we're supposed to be in step with God. And, and, and that'll make us a little odd to the world. Remember what, what did Jesus say about the world? The world hated me. Marvel not if it hates you. The kind of Christianity that the world thinks is cool. The kind of Christianity that, that, that kind of thinks, hey man, this is alright, we're okay, we're, we're cool man, we're, 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 we're with you. Huh? You know what? That kind of Christianity is foreign to the Bible. That's, that's never, never, ever taught in the Bible. And so understand, as the world gets worse, and we stay where we're supposed to stay, and we believe what we're supposed to believe, we will become more and more peculiar. Because we're not marching to that beat of that drummer. We're, we're, we're following the Word of God. We said we, we have to make sure we're staying true to what God says is right. Not the world isn't our standard. You know, the, the world, things change so much. We, we know part of this, some of this stuff that was going on here a while back, you know, they, they get upset over slavery. Well, there was a time the world thought that was good. Then they said, no, it's not good. Right? There's a time, the, the world just, it changes. There's, I, I could go on, but I, I won't. Go ahead, Xavier, thank you. I got I to gotta get into this week's study. I can get, I'll get off chasing that and we won't go anywhere. So the enemy is the world. So we said, uh, I think this is where we start now, right? A, is that right? A, underneath that point, is this. I must refuse to be guided by the world's standard of right and wrong. At some point, Christian... You're going to have to decide, I'm not going to be guided by what the world says is right or wrong. I will have to go by what God says is right or wrong. And listen, that's, that's not as easy as it sounds. Because everybody wants you to set your clock by the town clock. They want you to be like everybody else. Call it political correctness, call it being you know, culturally acceptable, whatever you want to call it. Uh, if you don't fall in line with that, then you need some sensitivity training. You need some help. We got to give you some, some additional uh, work on that. You, I don't, it doesn't matter, listen, it doesn't matter what everybody else is doing, what everybody else isn't doing. Because that isn't what I determine whether I do or not. It is what does the Bible say? What does the scripture say? And, and we want to go by the Word of God. What is written in the Word of God? Nothing can be right that God says is wrong. Nothing can be right that God says is wrong. Doesn't matter what the world calls, calls it. If God calls it a sin, it's a sin. We can't think lightly of drinking alcohol. We can't think lightly of swearing or cursing, gambling, lying, cheating, stealing. Why? Because it's so common. Everybody does it. Well, it doesn't matter to us. 
you understand the, the, the founding fathers, when they established uh, the Republic of the United States of America, they did it on the basis that people would obey God. They did it on the basis that people were going to do what was right in God's sight. The majority of us in this room tonight, listen, it doesn't matter if somebody had their purse sitting on the aisle or if somebody uh, had, uh, you know, you, you watch somebody walk out and they dropped a $100 bill on the ground, there wouldn't be a problem with anybody in this room picking it up and putting it in their pocket. You would all pick it up and say, hey, 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 you dropped this. You'd want to give it back to them. That's because you know that's the right thing to do in God's sight. Let me say this before, you know, if you go down the street and you see your neighbor's garage door up, you don't say, oh, I wonder what, what, what he's in there that I could use. Huh? Now, if he's your neighbor and he borrows a bunch of stuff, you may go in and get your stuff back. I don't know. But uh, that's, that's another issue. But the, uh, you don't think about that. You don't, you don't look at that. You know, like, like we did the one night we left our garage door up and somebody thought it would be nice to take the, my wife's car. And they did. You see, because, you know what? There aren't enough policemen to be watching everybody all the time. There's got to be people that have a moral compass that say, I'm going to answer to God. I want to do what's right in God's sight. You understand? And, and, and so we have to go by what God says is right, not just what the world thinks is right. People oh, what's the harm? It's just a little white lie. Oh, what's the harm? I'm just taking a little bit here. What's the harm? I'm just... Uh, uh, spending a little bit here. I'm gambling a little bit here. The problem is, is it, is it right by the Bible or is it wrong by the Bible? Is it condemned by the Bible or is it commended by the Bible? You have to realize that at some point, you'll, you'll go against the crowd, and you will. You'll be going against the crowd if you follow God's Word. You won't be the, you won't be the popular guy. You'll be the unpopular guy. To be an unpopular girl. But you won't go against the Bible. You won't flinch on that. That's biblical separation. Except what God says is right, not what the world says is right. Number two, B under there. I also, listen, that means I have to be careful about leisure time. And that may seem like it's not very important, but it's very important. You know, one of the greatest safeguards to the soul and not getting involved in the world is to work hard. When the farmer would get up and go to work early in the morning and work till sundown and come in and get something to eat, he was too whooped to do anything else. And you'd spend the time in, in quietness and you'd hit the bed early because in the morning it starts over again. You see, and we've lost that in our society and we, 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 we've tend to want to work less and get more leisure time, but in idle time is still the devil's time. And we've seen that happen over and over again. So be careful. Hey, anybody who wants to live a Christian life and live a life that's pleasing to God, better guard your what's called your pleasure time. Sometimes people use it, well, I need some me time. Well, it better be God in me time and not just me time. Because you better remind yourself, God is still with me. And, and it doesn't just mean I do whatever my flesh wants me to do. Evening time can be a difficult time. Evening time is a time when often people lay aside their armor and get in trouble. Nighttime. Proverbs warns about the woman who lurks in the evening and then into the darkness of night to get her prey. Evening is the time when People go out and do things that they shouldn't do. And they shouldn't be involved in. Darkness comes. Men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds are evil. And so yeah, you have to be careful. Worldliness can come in the evening time and in the dark time. My dad growing up, many of you heard me say this, you know, he used to tell me as a teenager, and uh, of course, you know, you're in high school and uh, you have the ball game on Friday night or on Saturday night and then there's a get together somewhere after the ball game and uh, I, I always had to be home by midnight. That was, that, was my, that was my curfew. And I mean, sunrise east, sets in west, two plus two is four, water runs downhill, I better be in at midnight, buddy. And, and, and I knew that. 
said, why'd you have been at midnight? Because my dad said nothing good happens after midnight. That was his rule. He said, did you ever question him? No, I wouldn't question him. And I, I thought I was doing pretty good because my sister, who's a year younger than I, she had to be an 11. Say, that's not fair. <laughs> Tell dad that, okay? See how far you get with that. And, uh, but you know what? Uh, I pastor a church, and she's married to a pastor for over 30 years in Oklahoma. So maybe there was something to that, what do you think? Maybe, maybe, we were, maybe we were pretty smart to listen to dad. And maybe dad knew what he was talking about. Tell me how you spend your evenings, and I can tell you what kind of character you have. Tell me how you spend your evenings, I'll tell you what kind of character you have. Don't waste your evenings. Tell, tell you, I tell you one of the quickest, one of the most important things you learn as a Christian, and even as a new Christian, but don't forget it as an old Christian. It's one of the important things, Joy and Nathan, about Sunday is to go to bed on Saturday night. You know, a lot of times when you first get saved, it's Friday night and Saturday nights are late nights. You know, you've had the experience, you had somebody get saved and, and they're supposed to come to church with you. And you go by to pick them up and you can't wake them up. They're still sleeping. You know why? They were up till 2 in the morning. And, and you, can, you may get up and you may come to church after being up till 2 in the morning, but you're not giving God your best on Sunday morning. You're sitting through Sunday school and nodding off and sitting in church and falling asleep. That's not giving God your best. Boy, that's quiet in here, isn't it? Huh? <laughs> Offending them all tonight, aren't I, Bob? Huh? The, you, how, many, how many times have we slothfully or quickly read a Bible passage neglected to pray or prayed very little because we were too tired from having been up too late the night before. Indulging the flesh. Or indulging worldliness. Hmm? We just, is it, was it really important that we had to stay up till midnight to see the end of that movie or the end of the ball game and neglect meeting with God the next morning? What kind of message does that send to God? What has that done to our soul? Are we opening ourselves up to the things of the world? Are we separating ourselves unto God? So often those habitual late hours will result in hurried prayers and slothful Bible reading and a time of slipping away from God. So we say we have to be careful. We have to not be guided by the world standard of right or wrong. We have to be careful about our leisure time. We're going to be separate from the world. Then number C, I must abstain from all amusements that are connected with sin. I'm going to abstain from all amusements that are connected with sin. Now, now we'll, we'll be real plain, okay? All right, you okay? Are you okay? Are you happy? All right. Let's check in. I don't know how anybody who makes a pretense at being a Christian can go to the casino. Or go to the racino. Is that what they call that down there on 23? I mean, gambling... And, and we've taught on this before here, is a, is, is, is a sin against God. It's a sin against mankind. It's made many, many people uh, poor people. It has hurt far more, far more than it's ever helped. What did they... Think back. Some of you have been here long enough. Think back of all the promises they made about the casino coming to Columbus. And how great it's going to be for the west side. How wonderful it's going to bring about development. You driven down Georgesville Road lately? Huh? Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to be in the plywood sales business if I would down along that area. 
things are closed up all over. It hasn't helped. They, they, they sold the lottery and the, the casinos as a way of education. Oh, it's going to fund education. You won't have to have your taxes going up all the time. How's, how's that worked? Huh? They, they sold us another lie, didn't they? Well, this is this will part the waters here. I I do not attend the movie theater. I don't go there. If there's if there's any one that is as anti God as Hollywood is, I don't know who it is. They're as hateful as God to God and anti God as anything can be. They're, they're in favor of everything that God is against. Immorality, drunkenness, gambling, lying, cursing, nudity. And we want to know if it's okay to go to the movies. You know what we're saying? Come here, world. You know what we're saying? Stay there. Saying, be separate, be separate. What? Friday night? Yeah. <laughs> What's playing? Hmm? I want to spend Friday night and Saturday night with the world. And then come over to church on Sunday. And say, boy, that's boring. Boy, this isn't any fun. <laughs> All you're doing is showing everybody I'm worldly. I'm worldly. I don't care about spiritual things. I'm more comfortable with the world than I am with God's people. Shame on us. Shame on us. Now, hey, you, you think, man, are you weird? I, I, I know. But I'm just teaching and preaching what Bible-believing preachers have taught for years. I just haven't changed like so many have. We just haven't moved over like so many have. Believe me, there's preachers used to preach just what i just preaching right now who don't anymore. They've come over here. And said, you guys are out of touch. Out of touch with who? Out of touch with what? The only one I'm concerned to being in touch with is God. And remember, separate, separate, separate. That's what they're crying. Holy, holy, holy. That's what we're supposed to be. Thanks, Savior. Are you still happy? Yeah, you're lying to me. Are we, listen, is the world a danger to us or not? Are we to come out from the world and be separate or not? All right, let's go to number D. Letter D, I guess, to be accurate. I must be careful about my relationships with worldly people. Now, we're going to meet unconverted people, unsaved people. As long as you're in the world, you're going to be around them. You can't avoid having interaction with them. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5 with me, will you please? 1 Corinthians chapter 5. First Corinthians chapter 5. Notice what Paul wrote in verse 9. 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 9. 
I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. Saying, I'm, I'm not telling you that you're not going to have associations with these people because you are. You're in the world. They, they may be somebody you work with. Maybe somebody that you're next to in the shop or next to in your job and there's nothing you can do about that. You work there. Understand that. It may be somebody in your neighborhood and you live beside them. It may be your neighbor. But there's a, there's a big difference between being an acquaintance of them and being a friend with them. There's a big difference. To choose their company, to cultivate a friendship with them, is very dangerous to your soul. You see, our, our human nature, we're, we're, we're so made up that the people we associate with affect us. They have an effect on us. It affects our own character. The proverb says this, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Proverbs 13.20 So again, if I, as a Christian, if I choose, as my friends, those who don't care about the Bible, don't care about God, don't care about Christ, don't care about holiness, or, or regard that as kind of not very important, then it will be impossible for me to prosper and to be successful in my relationship with God. It will affect me in a negative way. And it will you too. You become like the people you associate with. That's the Bible principle. I had a... Through high school, I was a Christian. And I, I didn't drink, didn't smoke. People knew that. Went to fellowship of Christian athletes. Things like that. But I wasn't as strong a Christian as what I should have been. And I had a good friend. He was a, it, was, it was really interesting. He, was, he, was, he became my best friend, but he played football. I didn't play football. I played basketball. He didn't play basketball. I played baseball. He didn't play baseball. But we became friends. Did a lot of things together. And we still, we've connected here in later years. His name was Vince. And, uh, but whenever I talked about after those ball games through high school and these parties you go to, I didn't drink, but there was drinking going on. And, and there was uh, usually uh, card playing going on, and I played cards. We played euchre. And he was my partner. And, and we'd clean up on people, okay? And we, he was my bud. And, and we were best friends. But I remember the day and I was 18, and, and I surrendered my life to do whatever God wanted me to do. And I remember that spring on my back patio at my house, sitting down with Vince and telling him that if he didn't get saved, and I gave him the gospel that day, and if he didn't trust Christ and he didn't want to live for God, I could no longer be his friend. That we would go two different directions. And that was hard. That was hard to do. I was an 18-year-old young man and tough and rough, but, but I cried. That, that was hard. He was my friend. We did, we did a lot of things together. But if I was going to go forward spiritually, I couldn't continue that friendship with someone who wasn't interested in going forward spiritually. I couldn't do it. If you have to choose between the loss of a friend or cause injury to your spiritual soul, to your spirit, then there's no decision to be made. Do I, do I have the loss of a friend or do I lose the fellowship with God? 
we're, there's no choice, is there? there? There shouldn't be. If a friend won't walk the narrow way with you, then you must not walk in the broad way with them. Any, any attempt to keep a close friendship between a, a saved person and a lost person is to an listen, it, it's, 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 it's an impossibility if I'm true to my nature, which is the new nature, and they're true to their nature, which is the old nature, then, then it is impossibility for us to be compatible. Impossible. You know, that's why it's, very, it's so very important. When a godly Christian, I'm talking about a Christian that wants to please God, that is reading their Bible, studying their Bible, you're meditating in the Word, you're praying, you're really seeking to please God. And you're looking for someone who will be a life partner with you that you consider someone who also is seeking God and wanting to please Him and reading their Bible and studying their Bible. Don't just settle with the fact, well, they're, they're Christian. Oh no, they, they ought to be more than that. Or you're headed for heartache. And, and, let's, and by the way, some don't even have that standard. I'm, a, I'm, I'm amazed at times and, and, and oftentimes soul winning, you know, you don't always see, Brother Lawrence, you know, you don't always see husband and wife together at home. You see one or the other. And it's amazing. When, when one gets saved, oftentimes during the daytime in years past, you would find the, the woman at home and now it's, it's all over. Everybody has different schedules. But oftentimes, and I would say after the woman got saved, I said, now what about your husband? Does he know Christ as his Savior? Do you know he's ever been saved? You know what they usually say? I don't know. No idea. No idea of the spiritual condition of the one whom they're married to. That's, that was always boggling to me. Now maybe to some of you who grew up uh, unsaved or and unchurched and not around the things of God, that was not something they ever really thought about. But certainly, mom and dad, you better teach it to your children. And grandma and grandpa, teach it to your grandchildren. That, that, that from, I mean, from little on up, teach it to them. That, that they ought not only to be a Christian, they ought to be a Christian that is seeking to please God. And a Christian that loves God with all their heart and all their soul and all their mind and all their strength. And they want to go the same direction you're going. Are you, my friend, are headed for a life of turmoil and heartache? Never, never, never marry someone who's not an out and out Christian. You, you're better off dying and going to heaven than marrying an unbeliever. You will have all, all sorts of problems. Stand to that. Teach your children that. Don't let anybody talk you out of that. Don't, don't get weak on that. You'll, you will find it nearly impossible to come out from among them and be ye separate. Well, we've got to hurry. Number four. I must realize separation is a matter of the heart. James 4.4, 4, we read it earlier, that whosoever will, therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now, we, we said before, does that mean you're unkind to people who don't know Christ? No. We be very kind. Jesus was called the friend of sinners. He was very kind and very, very, very uh, good to them and, and, and gracious to them. But his close friends were the disciples and probably Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Those were his close friends. 
That's who he spent his time with. They were all true Christians. John Bunyan, in Pilgrim's Progress, wrote this about those who are trying to pull a man back from seeking salvation. He said, quote, You live in the city of destruction, and all who die there will sink lower than the grave into a place that burns with fire and brimstone. Be convinced, good neighbors, and go along with me. What? exclaimed the man who was following him. And leave all our friends and comforts behind? Yes, said the one seeking Christ. For all that you give up is not worthy to be compared for that which I seek. That's so true. We're called out of the world because we're called unto Christ. You see? We're called to leave the world so we can be with Christ. Remember? Separate. 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 We can't be with the one who is separate if we're not separate, you can't be with Him. The person who refuses to stop looking to the world for friendship, if, if I'm the Christian, and, and I know where God is, and I know where God wants me to be, and I love the world, and I'm, I'm looking to God, but I'm, you know what? I can't look both ways at the same time. You know what you end up being? A double-minded man. And as long as I'm looking to the world for my comfort and my friendship and my entertainment, I'll never look to God. I'll never get it from Him. It'll be impossible. And a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate. And I, notice what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and I will receive you. You know what that is? You know what God says? He said, you come out from among them. You know what, you know what it says? I, the word receive there, you know what it is? I'll embrace you. God says, I'll give you, I'll embrace you just like the father did the prodigal when he came home. I'll embrace you. Huh? I'll put my arms around you. Does God, does God, does God have favorites? Sure. Those who want to be separate. He'll embrace you. He'll put his arms around you. That's what it says, isn't it? Notice what he says. I'll embrace you, I'll receive you, and will be a father unto you. You see, separation is a matter of my heart. What he's asking is, will you stop trusting the world for what you need and trust me for what you need? And that is a matter of our heart. What will I trust in? Christ died for us that He might purify unto Himself a peculiar people, that we should show forth the praises of Him who called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. We're separated unto the gospel of Christ. The ultimate end of the separation, again, is not just from the world, but our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Why are we separate? So we can fellowship with God. If I'm not separate, He can't embrace me. It doesn't mean He's not my Father. It means He can't be a Father to me. And He can't be a Father to you if you're unwilling to separate. It's a happy and blessed thing to be separate. It's not a cumbersome thing. It's not a burdensome thing. Psalm 1, blessed is the man. What's the blessed mean? Happy. happy. Blessed is the man that does what? Walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, stands not in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. You know what that is? Separation. Separation. And you're happy. And because you'll do that, 
Your delight is in the law of the Lord. And in His law will you meditate day and night. If you don't do verse 1, you'll never do verse 2. So many today profess to be born again, but they do not separate from sin. They do not separate from the world. The world's the world is pouring many believers right into its mold to be just like them. And that's why we have those who profess godliness but deny the power thereof. Let me give you the last one, number five. We must realize separation affects my fellowship with God. This is what we were talking about earlier when we said, God said, I'll receive you, I'll embrace you, and I'll be a father unto you. And ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. He's not saying that he, that he is or isn't our father. He is our father. He's your father when you trust Jesus as your Savior. But if you're not separate, he can't be a father to you. When the, when the prodigal son decided to leave home, could his father be a father to him? No. Was he still his father? Yeah. But he couldn't be a father to him. God is always your father. Don't forget that. What he's saying here is, I'd like to act like a father. But whether I can act like a father to you or not is up to you and how you behave. And whether you'll be separate. I'd like to treat you as a son. Now, if you go off into worldliness and you go off to friends of the world, you know what God says? God says, I'll chasten you. God will take you to the woodshed. But I'm going to tell you something. I, I had three children and, and, and brought them up and, and gave them all spankings when at times they needed it. But you know what? I never enjoyed any of it. And if you enjoy spanking your child, you got problems. You got to do it. But it's not something you enjoy. Do you think God wants to spend your whole relationship time just whipping you? Do you think He enjoys that? No. He wants to embrace you. He wants to receive you. That's why He says, come out from among them and be ye separate so I can be a father to you. then God can have an intimate relationship with you. Like a father and a son. Some of you know this. I have a brother, Scott, who went to heaven in 2010. He had pancreatic cancer. Scott was two years older than I. And... Scott was a phenomenal athlete. Wasn't tall, probably five foot ten, but could just he could he could shoot lights out with the basketball, could jump, could was quick, could could uh, he I don't know if he still does. He did for a long time hold the eighth grade record for points in a game. He scored sixty six points in one game as an eighth grader. Uh, at five foot ten, he was he was phenomenal. Played varsity in in public school as a freshman. But that freshman, when I was going into seventh grade, is when my mom and dad got divorced, and Scott got in the wrong crowd, and he experimented with some kind of pills or drugs or something. I I, I don't know. I was young. I I just knew he was doing the wrong things and my, my dad gave him a choice to either go to Roloff Homes in Texas, Lester Roloff, and, or go to my uncle's in Arkansas, my dad's brother. And he went out to my uncle's in Arkansas. And he finished his junior and his senior year of high school out in Parkin, Arkansas. And played basketball out there, worked on the farm. But he out there, he, because of my cousins who uh, were farmers, but they were drinkers. Work hard all day and then, then drink beer most of the evening. And 
My brother lost, he had a scholarship to go to college for basketball and stuff, and he lost that. And he struggled with alcohol, and he, he ended up getting married to a girl, and he had a family, but he wouldn't have anything to do with church. Grew up like I did. We grew up going to church Sunday morning, Sunday morning, and I remember as kids, we had notebooks, and we had sermon notes in there. He had one just like I had one. Made a profession of faith in Christ when he was younger. But he lived most of his life never taking his family to church. Didn't tell them about God. Smoked, drank. His wife told me when, when Scott found out he had pancreatic cancer, he, he quit smoking, he quit drinking. And his wife, Yvonne, told me, she said right away we realized $400 a month more income. That's how much he was spending on cigarettes and alcohol. And got his life, by the way, got his life right with God. And, and, and many times in the last few months when he contracted cancer, I'd come up there and he'd be reading his Bible and told, told people about how wrong he was. Got an opportunity to, to give the gospel to his wife and his children. But, but during those years when he was with his family and growing up and away from God, he told my dad, he said, I don't want to come to family gatherings. I don't want to be around anybody. Don't even invite me. There were many years we had, you know, holidays, your families get together and you have picnics, and we had a, quite an extended family, but Scott and his family would never come. He didn't want to be a part of that. He wouldn't call and talk to my dad. He, he didn't have a relationship with him. Now, was, was my dad still his dad? Yeah. But you know what broke my dad's heart? Was that he couldn't be a father to him like he wanted to. I don't know. God had to, you have to give all the credit to God. God did something in my heart when I was just in high school. And I've told you this before. There came a point in my life where I wasn't ever concerned about getting a whipping from dad or getting disciplined from dad. One of the things that, that, that would hurt me the most if my dad would look at me and say, I'm really disappointed in you. You really let me down. Man, that, you might as well stick a knife in me. That, that, that killed me. Never, never wanted that. And, and, and all through the years, we had a good relationship. You know, we talked almost weekly on the phone. And with, it, it, just a, it was just a, you know what? He could be a father to me. Why? Because of the way I chose to live. He could embrace me. And that's all God's saying. He's saying, can he be a father to you? Are you willing to leave the world and be separate to him so he can embrace you? And love you like he wants to. And bless you like he wants to. Have the relationship with him like he wants you to. Come out from among them. And be ye separate. Let's stand together, shall we? Father, take the truth now this evening. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to our hearts tonight. And thank you for the plain teaching of the Bible. Thank you, Lord, that you love us that much, that you desire that we be close to you, that you embrace us, that you put your arms around us. Lord, we, we realize you can't be that father to us if we won't come out from the world and be separate. And I pray, God, that you'd help us in our heart not to love the world, neither the things that are in the world. But that we would love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, all our strength, and all our mind. Help us, Lord, to be separate, to be holy, for you are holy. Separate from the world, but separate unto our God. That we might have a close, intimate fellowship with you. And show us, Lord, that that's the happy life. That's the satisfied life. I pray that the truth has helped folks this evening. And that, Lord, it will make a difference in our life. 
as we strive to walk with you. Dismiss us now with your care, Lord. Again, we pray that you'll be with our missionaries as they're heading our way and that you'll prepare our hearts for what you want to do in each of our lives over the next four days. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to sing in just a minute. Hey, you still have cards out. You still have gifts out. We've got to get those in, okay? Uh, getting all those sorted out and, you know, getting them ready to go, for the, that doesn't just magically happen. People have to work at that, okay? And if it doesn't come in till Saturday, that makes it rough, okay? So uh, some of you have outstanding cards. Get them in. Get them in. If you can't do it, then just turn the card in and say, I'm sorry, we thought we could handle it, but we just weren't able to. That's okay. And, um, but just, just let them know. That way they can know what, what's still out, what's coming in, and we can get those things ready to go. All right? Help us out. We, I know the ladies would appreciate that. Okay. Let's sing. The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. Here we go. The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. There's joy, joy, joy in my heart since Jesus made everything right. I gave him my old tattered garment. He gave me a robe of pure white. I'm feasting on manna from heaven. And that's why I'm happy. That's why you're happy. That's why you're happy. God bless you. You're dismissed.